Okay, so when I opened up my news apps this morning, I see this headline, RFK Jr. Affair with reporter from New York Magazine, Olivia Nuzzi, and I confess I felt disappointed. I never liked to hear of anybody being unfaithful to their spouse. RFK Jr. is married to actress Cheryl Hines. I specifically don't like to see people in the public eye who many look up to be unfaithful to their spouses. So my first reaction to this was disappointment. I also know RFK Jr.'s history with women. I'm not gonna whitewash that. He was unfaithful to his first wife and kept a sex journal about it, something pretty messed up. He cheated on his first wife with dozens of women. So the idea that this could be believable was plausible in my mind. But then I started reading and it turns out that this may be a political hit job against RFK Jr. And let me tell you, nothing makes me more outraged than political hit jobs against men where that are premised on a false accusation of sexual misconduct in order not only to discredit the man's political stance, like Kavanaugh, for example, but to utterly destroy him, his life, his reputation, and his family in the process. And it seems that there are red flags in this story that point to that being the case. We don't know for sure. I want to say that. We don't know for sure. We could have more information that comes out later that shows us that RFK was behaving improperly with this woman. But this is what we know. Olivia Nuzia is the reporter involved. She's been suspended from her job pending an investigation by New York Magazine. And when you hear the word affair, you think of an illicit sexual affair. But that is not what happened. They did not have physical contact here. This is what Nuzia said during that time when she was reporting on RFK's presidential campaign. I did not directly report on the subject, RFK, or use them as a source, the relationship was never physical, but should have been disclosed to prevent the appearance of a conflict. I deeply regret not doing so immediately and apologize to those I've disappointed, especially my colleagues at New York. Okay, so she just said it was, the relationship was not physical. Well, you can still have an affair. You could have an emotional affair. (laughs) According to CNN, this relationship was digital in nature. So what does that mean, texting? So we're, we're climbing down the rungs here of what the headline originally portrayed this to be. Again, it doesn't mean that this couldn't have been inappropriate texting, but um, it wasn't an affair in person. In fact, RFK Jr.'s team responds to this and said, Mr. Kennedy only met Olivia Nuzzi once in his life for an interview that she requested, which yielded a hit piece. Okay, so now this is, this is looking a little bit different than it, was, than it was first portrayed to be. Now, here's a couple of questions that I ask myself because we don't know exactly what's inside of this, but I, I ask myself why, why are they reporting on this now? RFK Jr. has a history of womanizing. I know a lot of people say, oh, he's a Kennedy. I personally hate that when people say that because I don't think that because you have a certain last name, because you come from a certain family that, that permits or excuses immorality, but it's plausible that this could happen given his history of it. But why now? Why this hit piece now versus a year ago, versus two years ago? Well, the answer to that is because RFK Jr. endorsed Trump. And people on the left know that this is a really big deal. They know that RFK's endorsement of Trump impacts a specific demographic of voter that Democrats think they own. Democrats think they own women. Democrats think that they own suburban women in particular. And RFK Jr. and Trump, by the way, suffers in that voting demographic. A lot of suburban women don't want to vote for Trump or say they won't vote for Trump. They're voting for Kamala. But RFK Jr., even though he is not a radical leftist, he is leftist on some issues, but by and large, he is not a full-on leftist of the style of Kamala Harris, RFK Jr. appeals to suburban white women, particularly. Why? Because of his activism when it comes to the safety and efficacy of childhood vaccines. And so when RFK Jr. endorsed Donald Trump's campaign, Democrats panicked, utter panic, because this, this demographic of women that they need to vote for Kamala Harris in order for Kamala Harris to plausibly win was suddenly at risk of voting for Donald Trump because RFK was telling them to. So enter a character assassination against RFK Jr. Now, all that being said, even if this is true, even if we end up finding out something that tells us, oh, okay, yeah, this was inappropriate texting or whatever, should it change our vote for Donald Trump? In my opinion, no, it shouldn't. It is disappointing when someone doesn't live up to the moral standards that we want them to, but it doesn't, the, the, the question that I ask myself when a politician does not live up in his personal life to the moral standards that I would want him to, I ask, okay, but is it going to impact his performance in the White House? Does this impact uh, his policies? Is this going to distract or distract from his work or um, cause us not to trust him or diminish his efficacy as a politician? And the answer to that when it comes to RFK is no, because he's behaved in that way for a long time, and he still has a proven track record of being an advocate, especially for 
um, especially for children who've been injured by vaccines. So again, the question is, why is this why is this piece coming out now and why is it falsely portraying what might have or might not have happened? Why is this being portrayed as an affair when it seems like they texted? So here's what's really interesting. So the New York Magazine put out a statement and said, recently our Washington correspondent Olivia Nuzzi acknowledged to the magazine's editors that she engaged in a personal relationship with a former subject relevant to the 2024 campaign while she was reporting on the campaign, a violation of the magazine's standards around conflicts of interest and disclosures. Had the magazine been aware of this relationship, she would not have continued to cover the presidential campaign. An internal review of her published work has found no inaccuracies nor evidence of bias. She is currently on leave from the magazine, and the magazine is conducting a more thorough third-party review. We regret this violation of our readers' trusts. So you hear that, and everything I just say bec said becomes almost irrelevant. So this wasn't... The accusation here isn't even that this was a sexual relationship or that this was inappropriate, even if it was just digital or via text, because... Both of them have established that it wasn't physical or in person, that they'd only met once ever for an interview, which resulted in a hit piece. This was actually wrongdoing on her part and wrongdoing only by journalistic standards. This wasn't a moral question. This was the magazine said you're not allowed to have a personal friendship with someone who's part of a campaign that you're reporting on when you're supposed to be an objective journalist. She did that. And so the magazine said, hey, you broke a rule. You're not allowed to do that because that's not what we want. We don't want any of our coverage to be tainted by your bias towards a particular subject. That's a totally different story than what the mainstream media is portraying it to be. Again, uh, there are a few topics that outrage me as much as men facing false accusations of sexual misconduct in an era where the left says we should believe all women, this hashtag Me Too campaign, where we are supposed to utterly destroy a man based on some frivolous accusation that has no backing. This is very possibly another example of that. It's also ridiculous and a double standard for the left to pretend that they care about conflicts of interest when it comes to media relationships with politicians in the first place. Think about Kamala Harris, for example, who's been her best friend for the past decades, the head of ABC News. Yes, the same ABC News that staged that biased debate that Kamala Harris had against Donald Trump, where the fact-checking only was against Donald Trump and wasn't accurate while Kamala Harris told lie after malicious, evil lie and faced zero fact-checking. Maybe, just maybe, that bias stemmed from Kamala Harris's best friendship with the head of ABC News, and yet no one seemed to care about that, did they? That person has not been suspended from their job. Or George Stephanopoulos, for example. George Stephanopoulos, who is the fixer for the Clintons, and now we pretend like he's this objective media figure who's just calling bulls and strikes. No, he's a fixer for Hillary Clinton? Are you kidding me? And Karine jean pierre the press secretary of the Biden administration, she was, I think, formerly gay married to a CNN person. So let's not pretend that the idea of any kind of personal relationships or conflicts of interest between Democrat politicians and the media are problematic for Democrats at all. No, 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 no. This not affair that the mainstream media is reporting on that RFK had with Olivia Nuzzi, which was nothing more than a texting, whatever they were texting, I have no idea, but was nothing more than texting, but violated New York Magazine's rules. She wasn't allowed to text him as a friend when she was reporting on his campaign. This rule only applies if the person, RFK, has endorsed Donald Trump. The media is the propaganda arm for the Democratic Party, and how dare the media speak in a friendly manner to someone who is opposed to Democrat policies like RFK Jr. And by the way, you want to talk about sexual morality for a minute or sexual immorality for a minute? Let's talk about the New York State officials, COVID officials, who, while they were locking people in their homes during COVID, denying old people who were dying in hospitals, denying them their family members by their bedside at the moment of their death, they were themselves holding drug-fueled sex parties during lockdowns. We have undercover footage of New York State COVID officials admitting to this. We're going to show you that in just a second. First, I want to talk to you about one of the sponsors for our show that I know you guys love, and that's Hillsdale College. Time is our most precious commodity, right? I, we've talked about this so many times. Many of my listeners have asked for my advice about how they can spend their time wisely to be able to discern the truth. What news sources are accurate? What history should I read? What books should I have on my bookshelf? Well, the answer to that question is why I'm so excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subject. This is not just for college students, by the way. This is for you and me so that we can understand the truth. The left 
always wants to twist the truth. We have to have this baseline knowledge of a lot of different topics in order to identify their lies. So through these courses at Hillsdale, you can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, or the history of the ancient Christian church, all with Hillsdale College's online courses. And by the way, they're all available for free. That's right, for free. I personally recommend you sign up for C.S. Lewis on Christianity. It's a seven lecture course. In this course, you'll examine some of Lewis's classic works, including Mere Christianity, The Screwtape Letters, The Abolition of Man, to see what Lewis had to say about scripture, prayer, suffering, joy, heaven, and hell. And the course is self-paced, so no pressure. You can start whenever, wherever. Enroll now in C.S. Lewis on Christianity to discover Lewis's core lessons regarding the truth and goodness of the Christian faith and how to apply those lessons in your life. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash Liz to start. It's free. It's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash Liz to start. Hillsdale.edu slash Liz. Okay, so let's talk about what happened in New York State because the left tells us we're supposed to care about sexual impropriety. This is not only sexual impropriety on the part of New York State COVID officials. This is debauchery. Drug-fueled sex parties hosted behind the scenes while you and I, everyday Americans, were being locked in our homes, told that if we didn't take the COVID vaccine, we would be fired from our jobs, deprived being with our loved ones as they died in hospitals. I don't even need to tell you what Andrew Cuomo's administration in New York did to old people in nursing homes. Forcing nursing homes to take COVID positive patients so that thousands upon thousands, we're talking 11,000 seniors died in New York when they shouldn't have. And meanwhile, the people who implemented this tyranny, this is what they were doing behind the scenes. This is from Steven Crowder. It's an undercover video taped of the officials who implemented, who instigated, who imposed these lockdowns, admitting to having these drug-fueled sex parties. Take a look. I actually was the one who convinced the mayor to make it a mandate. Like, New York City found out that you were having sex no, parties no. during yeah. COVID? Yeah. Yeah, it would have been real bad. We went to some, like, underground, like, dance party, like, underneath a bank in Wall Street. And we were all rolling, we were all taking Molly, and everyone was high, and I was so happy, because I hadn't done that in, like, a year and a half, like, a year or whatever. And I, But I was looking around being like, because this was not Wait, COVID friendly. Was? The only way I could do this job for the city was if I had some way to blow off steam. Oh. I kind of sneaky about it because hotels didn't want people gathering there. Because I was like running the entire city. My wife like, and I like had one with our friends uh -huh. like in August of like that first summer. So we rented a hotel and it was fun. We all like took like you know Molly and just like there's like eight or nine of us in a ten or eight to ten of us in a room and. Yeah. Everybody had a blast because everybody was like so pent yeah. up uh -huh. because oh, it had been yeah. like everybody was just like stuck together and stuff like that. Yeah. And sometimes it isn't so much about like imagery and executive stuff. Sometimes it's just something about like bodies being close to each other, right? just being like naked with friends. Is that like what? Like, like, yeah. It was like the summer of 2020. Yeah. So like walk around the streets and eat outdoors. Did you have like any there wasn't any restrictions on gathering, like you could technically gather people. The hotels didn't want it inside parties, but they weren't going to like. Yeah. Why is it that it's always the ugliest, grossest people that engage in the most perverted sex fetishes? Being naked with friends? Disgusting. You absolute freak. That's Dr. Jay Varma speaking. He talks about these drug-fueled sex parties at an undercover, an underground bank on Wall Street and going to a hotel and taking Molly and ecstasy and MD and MA and being naked with friends. Meanwhile, again, everyday people like you and me and our family members locked down in New York, not allowed to gather, facing vaccine mandates and not allowed to be with our dying grandmothers in the hospital because people like that were too busy being sexual perverts in a basement bank on Wall Street saying that they, they had pent up energy because they, they'd all been locked down together. But do we hear any of the mainstream media reporting on this? The same mainstream media that's trying to portray whatever this non-story is about RFK as being some salacious sex story. We don't hear anything from them about actual perverted sexual behavior coming from people like Dr. J. Varma. And by the way, this is not the only example of that. Think about the Sean Diddy Combs story from this week. Okay, so what we have there is a prominent rapper one of the most famous of all times, who was arrested and is being charged for sex trafficking. The reports are that he was hosting these really 
I mean, I don't even want to call them orgies, these gigantic sex parties where he would bust in male prostitutes and coerce young women into having sex with the male prostitutes in front of him. This was something that was widely known in Hollywood. People have been actually making jokes about this or references, kind of covert references to it for a long time. So it was one of those... Um, known secrets, you might say. And it's funny to me because the mainstream media who, again, are pretending to, you know, are to pretending to faint onto their, their, their couches about this non-story about RFK, where's their coverage of the Sean Diddy Combs? Was he sex trafficking? Was he actually moving, transporting prostitutes across state lines, which is illegal? Was he coercing young women into sex? I mean, this is, this is, he's been charged by federal authorities for sex crimes. And yet the media is barely covering this at all. It's essentially a non-story just days after this happened. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that? Is it because they don't care about this stuff? No, it's not because they don't care about it. Is it because they haven't heard about it? No, it's not because they haven't heard about it. Is it because they don't think it's a big story? No, it's none of those things. It's because they knew about it. It's because a lot of these people have probably been involved, at least ter in a tertiary way, whether it's through being aware, whether it's through an invite, whether it's through a friend that's been there. These people... This Hollywood Democrat media conglomerate is all in the know about this disgusting impropriety. And the allegations are that, that Diddy videotaped these, these orgies, these sex parties, and then used those videotapes to blackmail the people that were involved. It's sort of like the Hollywood version of Jeffrey Epstein. And so that's your answer. That's why the media doesn't care about this actual sexual propriety, this disgusting perversion of what sexuality should be, because it would possibly implicate them. But again, they pretend to care about RFK. What about Kamala Harris and Willie Brown, a woman who slept her way to the top? You want to talk about disgusting sexual behavior. A 29-year-old having an affair with a 60-year-old married man in order to obtain a political position. You don't think that's disgusting? You don't think that that's so conniving and so, it's just so cold. You get the shiver just thinking about it. That's Kamala Harris. That's how she got into politics. Or her husband, Doug Emhoff. He had sex with his daughter's nanny, who was also the elementary school teacher of his child. It broke up his marriage. That's what caused his divorce. It broke up that family. Yet they don't care about that. They don't care about the implications of that sexual impropriety. They just say, oh, that's not something that we should talk about. That's their own family stuff. Let's not bring that up. That will just harm them. No, it's only this non-story about RFK because RFK had the audacity to, to endorse Donald Trump. Here's a way to think about it. Do you think that this story about RFK would have been reported at all, let alone in the biased way that the headline the headlines are saying today. Do you think the story would have been reported at all had RFK endorsed Kamala Harris? Of course not. Of course it never would have been. And you want to talk about disgusting sexual perverts? Guess who spoke at the DNC just a couple weeks ago? Bill Clinton. Yeah, the Democrat Party as an apparatus is embracing a really sexual pervert who used his power to coerce a woman into performing sex acts on him. Disgusting. So let's save our outrage for actual sexual impropriety, which again, we don't know all the details of the RFK story, but every detail that we know is showing us that the headlines we were served this morning are fake news. And it's so despicable, so despicable to try to take out a politician because you don't like his politics by ruining his reputation, his life, his family with allegations that he did something that there's no evidence that he did. It's absolutely disgusting.